This is the third lesson for the fall semester of 2020 with the book of Ephesians. Um, looking today, beginning in chapter 3 here, was the church is likened to a mystery. And if you remember in the uh, first class of church history, I uh, actually quoted a verse from Ephesians 3. Uh, we're looking at church history in Acts chapter 2 with the church beginning and uh, realizing that the church was a mystery in the Old Testament. And this is such an important doctrine that we, in order to rightly divide the word of truth, we have to separate Israel from the church and realize that the church is not the Old Testament. There are no passages about the church in the Old Testament. There are passages concerning the tribulation, uh, millennial kingdom, but there are no passages concerning the church. And Paul even when we get to chapter 3, here it goes on to say, For this calls off Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me, to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. We can talk about it a little while ago. But what Paul here is saying is that the information I'm going to give to you, I did not get from the scriptures. Okay? And remember that we had Old Testament scriptures. Well, by, by the book of Ephesus, or Church of Ephesus, they may have some New Testament. But uh, what he's saying is, I didn't, where did I get my information? Did I get it from the, the uh, Old Testament? No. How did I get it? It was made known to me by revelation. He made known to me the mystery. He said, as I wrote before in a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So this dispensation of, of, of grace is what a lot of people will refer to the church age of dispensation of grace. I don't like that. You know, I call it dispensation of the church instead of dispensation of grace. Why? Because it makes it sound like today we're under grace and the Old Testament they're under the law. And I've even heard people say today we're saved by grace, whereas in the Old Testament they were saved by the law. And that's not true. Old Testament people were saved by grace. Today we're saved by grace. And so to refer to the church as a dispensation of grace, I just think it adds a little bit of confusion. Uh, this is not a, a name right here. And so when people want to say, well, the Bible says the church is a dispensation of grace. No, it doesn't. This is a description. It's not a name. Uh, simply that the, the, the mystery of the church, the church is uh, the story of, of God's working day through his grace. But... Uh, Known by the revelation, known by the ministry, of, or the, known through the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God, uh, but not we don't have to have that name. Now, I'm gonna go back to what you used to say all the time. Can we go back to that screen sure. for a second? You used to say keep things in this context. Mm -hmm. So was Paul talking directly to the Gentiles here? Uh, Church of Ephesus, yeah. Yeah. So now would, would he be saying that the Gentiles? Uh, it could be that he, he's trying to explain dispensation to them for the grace. I, want, I, I got what I want in my head. It just ain't coming out of my mouth right. Yeah. Uh, the dispensation could be for the, the Gentiles. Well, the only thing they would not have done about any dispensation as such. Right. So, uh, so, and the word dispensation is just a rule, how God governed at that time. And what Paul's simply saying is at this time, uh, God's governing through His grace is through the church. Okay, uh, so I, I guess the point he's trying to make is that uh, uh, the church is, is led by God's grace, and so the, the ministry that you have today is through the grace of God, so, which really in the Old Testament was the same way. It, the, it was through God's grace. Yeah. So no matter what method God chose to use. Uh, whether dispensation of human government or dispensation of innocence or uh, uh, whatever it might be, it's still by God's grace that it does these things. The time element, Ephesians 3 5, Paul verifies here for us that as far as this dispensation, it was not known in the Old Testament. And usually I'll point out the, the book of Song of Solomon where there are people who believe that Song of Solomon is talking about um, the Jesus and the church. 
and that's why people they refer to Jesus as the uh, uh, Rose of uh, Sharon and the Lily of the Valley. Uh, the only problem with that is that's a complete misunderstanding of the book. If, if, and it's not, but if Song of Song is talking about Christ and the church, well, the Rose of Sharon and Lily of the Valley is referring to the female, not the male anyway. But it's not talking about... Song of Song is talking about Solomon and a Shulamite. They're mentioned in there. There's no, they're not a picture of anything else. They're not a picture of the church. Uh, Solomon had no knowledge of the church. The scripture doesn't change its meaning. If it changes meaning, then it's worthless to us. So if the Old Testament meant one thing and the New Testament means something different, that's, that's a big problem. God knows how to speak to us, and he doesn't change that. So Paul is saying here, in, in the past, when the other ages was not made known to sons of men. Moses did not know about the church. Joel didn't know about the church. It goes back to chapter Acts chapter 2, we talked about when Peter preached from the book of Joel, he's not saying that Joel said this is the church age or anything, because it wasn't. He was talking about the tribulation period. And so as far as the church, complete mystery. Uh, no matter what passage you find in the Old Testament, it's not a direct reference to the church. Now, can we apply the principle to the church? Absolutely. The Bible is very clear that the Old Testament is written for an example to us to follow. But as far as church doctrine, you know, we're not, we don't have all the sacrifices. Moses did. You know, we're in that different dispensation. So God is dealing with man through a different means. He dealt with him in the garden one way. Through conscience, he dealt with him uh, uh, through the human government. He dealt, he's going to deal with him through the church. And when the church is raptured, he's going to deal with uh, mankind like he did just prior to the church with the Holy Spirit coming upon. So it's important to understand that God has chosen to deal with man different ways throughout different time. The underlying thing has always been by God's grace because everything points to our, uh, to our ability for salvation. So other ages, nobody knew about the church. But now, as it's now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So Paul is out there starting churches. And he's saying that we now have knowledge of, of the church. Uh, we know that Acts chapter 2, the church began. Uh, at the moment the church began, uh, mankind, saved man, was indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. Now a person gets saved, and immediately uh, the Holy Spirit uh, uh, places them into the body of Christ. Uh, the body of Christ is the church. He is the head. We are the body. Uh, there could not be a body without people being placed into it. In the Old Testament, nobody's placed into it. So the New Testament, we are through the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. That began in Acts chapter 2. The nature of the mystery, uh, that the letting, Paul's letting people know in the day and time that is there a difference between Jew and Gentile? Well, yeah. Is there a difference between Old and New Testament? Yes. So, what is this mystery we have now? Well, that we should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of this promise in Christ by the gospel. So, today, there are, isn't really no Jew or Gentile as far as a difference in the church. We're all part of the same body. No matter what we are, there are, I would say, uh, Messianic churches, I think I talked about this a couple weeks ago, uh, Messianic churches, churches where uh, Jewish people get saved and they think almost that they're different than we are as Gentiles. And we're not. We're all the same. Uh, I don't think there should be Messianic churches. Because I, I think it, it misleads. It makes it sound like there, there's a difference between Jew and Gentile. And the Bible is very clear that there is not, no difference. That we are our fellow heirs and we're all of the same body. So no matter who gets saved today, whether Jew or Gentile, bond or free, Greek or Roman, they're all placed into that one body, and we all become that one flesh in that sense. So there are, there's no difference between these. The recipient of this mystery, Paul said, uh, again, I've read this a while ago, but I'll skip back down to verse 3, how that by revelation he made known unto the mystery. I already wrote that in a few words before, uh, chapters 1 and 2. He says, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. He says, things that I know, you'll know here in a minute. 
if you read what I'm, I'm writing, that God had him write to us. Wherefore, he said, I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God, given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, he said, whom less than all, the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So Paul said, I don't deserve this. Nobody deserves what God has given to us. That's why it's God's grace. If it was deserved, it wouldn't be God's grace. It'd be works. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of this mystery, which again, he says, from the beginning of the world has been hid in God who creates all things by Christ Jesus. So again, nobody knew about this organization that we're in today. Even in Matthew 16, when Jesus told Peter and the disciples, upon this rock I will build my church. And we hold that as the first prophecy of the church. Even at that point, nobody knew what that meant. The word church is the word ecclesia, which means called out. And so what Jesus simply was telling them in Matthew 16, he told Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church, my assembly, my called out assembly. But they didn't know about pastors. They didn't know about New Testament scripture going to be written. They didn't know how to, you know, deacons or organize anything at that point. They didn't know any of these things. Ecclesia. E K K L E S I A. Called out. Called out. You know, the root word ek e k uh, means out, uh, out of, or out from, uh, and then kaleo, which is the root word of uh, klesia. Kaleo means to call. So called out. We call, God called out a group of people, which is the church, and they're assembly. But again, like I say, for, the, for Peter and them, they know what that meant. Uh, it, it probably took years, really, for them to grasp everything, just like for us today. It takes a while. He said, how did the, by revelation, he made known unto me the mystery. So again, Paul saying is, how do I know these things? God told me. Can you find them in the Old Testament? No. And then the humbleness of that he had, he says, as far as I can, you know, I who I am doesn't matter. I'm less than the least of all saints when it comes down to it. But it's grace. And the word grace cannot be earned. I mean, it's like you're paying for a free gift. I know you can do that on TV. You know, just order today. You get this free. Just pay for shipping and handling. You know? But it's absolutely free. Years ago, I, mean, I was 18, 19 years old, at the car wash, the guy came up with this big old book. He was a Hare Krishna. And they're big in West Virginia. And uh, he had this book, and he said, these writings are thousands of years old. And I said, oh, yeah. He said, yes, John Lennon wrote the, or I mean, George Harrison wrote the introduction uh, of this. And I thought, George Harrison, mm, he was still alive at that time, but I don't think so. And he said, but it's a free gift I want to give you. And I thought, I took it. And he then said, uh, I talked about donations, and if I would donate, I can't remember how much it was, like $40, $50, he said. Ooh. And uh, I said, no, I don't have that, so he took the book back. I thought, well, I was said, wasn't that a free gift? <laughs> <laughs> if I would, if I was more bold back then, like it would be today, mm -hmm. I'd still have the book. <laughs> <laughs> the basis of the mystery? according to the eternal purpose, which the purpose in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, the church was a mystery in the Old Testament, unrevealed to mankind. Did God know about it? Oh, yes. I mean, when the Jews rejected Jesus as the Messiah, God didn't have to quickly come up with something. He knew. Didn't cause it to happen. Right? Knowing something's going to happen and causing it to happen are completely two different things. God did not force Israel to reject him. He knew, but you know, he still gave them a choice, a, a very definite choice that they could have made. And some individually did choose him. You know, Paul even said, did God forsake the Jews? I don't think so, I'm a Jew. No. But his eternal purpose uh, in sending his son. 
if the church did not, if the Jews had not rejected Jesus, Jesus would have still came, and he would have still died for their sin, and would still rise again from the dead. And that wasn't going to change, no matter what happened, that's not going to change. The results of the mystery, results of the church age, Remember in the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 16 was a passage concerning the Day of Atonement. And Day of Atonement is a very important holy day in Israel. Uh, Yom Kippur, uh, around September, October on our calendar. Uh, very important day because what the high priest would do is he would go out and get two goats and he'd put his hand upon one goat. And it, it was a picture of delivering Israel sent the goat. They would take that goat out into the wilderness somewhere, far enough away where it can never, ever, ever return. The other goat they would then sacrifice. And he would take the blood and he would go into the Holy of Holies. On that one day, he'd strip down off his, his uh, colorful robe to a plain linen robe. He would uh, very cautiously, after uh, publicly uh, bathing in a sense, to uh, show the inward, uh, the uh, outward action uh, of the an inward thing that he did was to make sure that he was, his sins were confessed, because he knew that if he went to that holy of holies with sin in his life, that he would instantly die. And so I can imagine how careful he was to do that. And when he did it, he would go in on, alone. Nobody else would go in into that throne. Well, now. Through this mystery, we have access to the throne. In fact, not only do we have access, but the book of Hebrews 4.16 tells us how we go to the throne. And how is that? Boldly. Boldly. And with boldness, we can go to the throne at any moment, at any time. What a great blessing that we have access to God through His grace. You know, with all the different things going on in your life, uh, whatever it may be, financial, social problem, health problems, I, I don't know, anything any, and everything. Imagine what it would be without God and what kind of life that you'd have. Is it any wonder why people turn to drugs and alcohol? Because you know, they're trying to find something to bring contentment to the life. And it doesn't happen. And so they get further and further into drugs to the point where they commit suicide or their mind's blown or what have you. Trying to find peace when God is ever present to give anyone peace that passes all understanding. And when we have boldness and access with confidence by faith in Him. And we're strengthened by the Spirit of God. There are times when I feel like I can't go on. Or I don't want to go on. But I realize that's just my feeling. It's not reality. Because reality says I can. Through God's grace. Not through my abilities, not through my powers. But I can do all things through Christ. Paul said, for this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he would grant you according to his riches of his glory to be strengthened by his Spirit in the inner man. Yeah. You have a friend that you decide you're praying for, or somebody, whoever it might be. Uh, you may not know what's going on in their life. Maybe you haven't talked to them in a while, but you feel like you need to pray for them. But here's a great prayer. Paul said, uh, he, he's praying, he said, I bow my knees before Jesus on your behalf, that he would grant you according to his riches, oops, uh, grant you according to his riches of his glory to be strengthened. So I can always pray that Levi be strengthened through the Spirit, that Lucy be strengthened, that whatever it is that you're going through, I can pray this and know that this is a biblical prayer. You know, will God grant this? I, I believe it will. Because I believe the Bible. And, and you know, if we pray according to His will, 
That means my heart has to be right before I pray it. Because if my heart's not right before I pray it, I'm not praying. Yeah? Uh, God, in Psalm 6, 6, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, God's not aware of it. Let me just say this, because I'm glad you brought that up. I had, I, I had told Priscilla about it. <laughs> you really, really, you had to say what you said Monday. Because I was going through some stuff, and I didn't know whether or not it was right. And then you said that, Psalm 66, 18. And you said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, God would not hear me. And you don't know what an impact that made on my life. And I said, God, I thank you for calling Dr. K to say that. Because I needed to know that. Yeah. Because sometimes we harbor stuff, and we don't realize we're harboring these things. And I, I always want God to hear my prayers. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I pray. I want them to hear yeah. it. Every one of us need to be prayed for. Yes. And if I regard it in my heart and uh, Debbie's going through a tough time in life, how selfish am I? Yeah. I mean, how self-centered and selfish am I to regard it in my heart when we have a sister in Christ mm -hmm. that needs our prayers right. or our comfort? So, yeah, that's why we have to be very, very careful. And that's mm -hmm. why we're constantly examining ourselves. Thank you. I needed that. Believers can know the love of God. I, I grew up in a home that did not express love. Um, in fact, uh, September of 1988 was the first time I can remember my mom ever saying that she loved me. And she said it right after I baptized her. That's why I remember so clearly September of 88. Actually, the night I was, the day I was ordained, uh, I baptized my mom and my oldest daughter. But when my mom said she loved me, I was like, I had to stop. And I went up to Carrie, my sister, and I said, Mom just said she loved me. I said, I don't know that I ever heard that before. And she said she didn't either. Well, you know, my mom became a new person at that point. And, and, you know, my mom took care of us. I, and I do think her mom loved us, but she never used that word. And I never felt loved. And I had a hard time with that. After I first got saved, I never felt like I could be loved. I used to even, in my mind, and when I would say to people, you know, God loves you, I would say, but he doesn't love me, in my mind, because that's what I felt. And for a long time, I had a hard time, you know, to understand that God could love me. And the longer I was saved, the more difficult it became to believe God could love me. Because I would talk to brothers and sisters in Christ and ask them about their relationship with God, ask them how they're doing, oh great, God is so good, and everything's wonderful. And man, since I got saved, never been a bad day in my life. And oh, I don't have those thoughts anymore, and I don't have those desires anymore. In my life, I still had those thoughts, and I still had those desires. And I felt like, you know what? Well, I, I know I wanted to be saved, but apparently God didn't accept me because I'm not like everybody else. Mm -hmm. And then what happened, as time went on, I've come to find out that m many Christians are liars. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and that they do have the same thoughts and the same problems as what I had. And when we lie and try to cover it up and make like, oh, you know, since I'm you know, Christian, everything's just wonderful. It's not. It's not. And when I became a Christian, a lot of things became more difficult. So, you know, I went through a tough time with that. And finally, it took a long time for God to get through to me that he loves me. Uh, but I remember my oldest child was about to be born. Man, I went through a tough time of depression. Thinking, here's a new life coming in. I don't know if I can love him. I, I don't know. I mean, I know I'm supposed to, but can I? Do I have that ability? Because, uh, like I said, I didn't grow up with love, really experiencing what love was about. Well, we can know the love of God. He said that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Right? Very important to understand. We know it's by God's grace that he gives these things to us. But it says they dwell in your hearts by faith. What is faith? Salvation. Mm -hmm. Receiving. Yeah, remember my definition of faith? Oh, uh, 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 Back on what? Oh, no. believing. Believing. Based, based, based on the word. Yeah, based on his word and acting on it. So, 
Faith means for us to know the love of God, we have to know what? His Word. His Word. Because His Word tells Christ may dwell in your hearts by the knowledge we have of Him. Uh, we acknowledge that we have of Him through the Word of God. It says, so, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Right. So, yeah, the faith is not something we muster up in ourselves. It's not that, you know, I, I wish I had more faith. I have all the faith I need, 1189 chapters of it. Now, I might not be exercising that faith through ignorance of His Word, and therefore it's not dwelling in my heart like it ought to. So, in order to really know the love of God, you have to know who God is. And how do you know who God is? Through His Word. So, there's faith dwelling in the hearts by knowledge of the Scripture. Not just because somebody told me, but because His Word told me and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints was breadth, length, and depth, and height, to know, by experience, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. I mean, do I deserve this? No, I don't think I do. Therefore, God does not love me. No. Whether I think or don't think, it doesn't make any difference. It's which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. So we can know God loves us, stated dogmatically in His Word, and therefore we don't have to wonder. You know, I think I've, I'm sure I mentioned this in the past. I was watching some Saturday. It was a Catholic show, and I just happened to turn it on, and it was a kid's show. And I watched it a little bit of it, and one of the kids asked the uh, priest with him, uh, why is it, he said, that some people think you could go to God and ask forgiveness, but we go to a confessional ask for forgiveness. And the guy said, you know, when we come back from break, I'll, let, I'll tell you exactly why. Well, I'm a channel surfer. As soon as a commercial comes on, I watch three other programs. You know, because I click, 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 click. And I might get back on time, I may not. Well, I watch those commercials, so I want to make sure I want to get this. And this is what he said. He said, the reason why as Catholics we go to the priest is because you know that when you go to a priest, you will know whether you are forgiven or not. But if you go to God, you may never know. That's what I thought. I mean, completely opposite. Well, in fact, not even going really opposite. I mean, one side is we go to God, we know for sure. We go to a priest, we probably know for sure that we haven't been. Because we're trusting Him. What, what a, a ridiculous thing to believe. And yet, people follow after that. Why? Because they don't know what they believe. Here's another one for you. <laughs> why do why do uh, Catholics go to the priest to uh, to ask on for confession, to ask for forgiveness, and all that, or to be their mediator? Is and the answer to me was because he's holier than I am. The priest is holier. Yeah, in their mind, yeah, because they're taught that. Because their answer, their pra the prayers will answer through him better yeah. than through me. Yeah. That's what that well, and that's what was. that is what the you know, uh, even the Presbyterian churches believe that. Uh, that's why the elder rule. What Presbyterian church is elder rule, uh, meaning that only the leadership, the deacons and trustees and what have you, run the church uh, because they're more spiritual than everybody else. And Baptist church is a congregational rule, meaning that every single person, uh, ideally. The congregational world today, even though it's what some churches are. Uh, meaning that uh, the priest is a believer. I have equal access to God than anybody. Nobody else has more access than what I can. And Presbyterian says no, only the leadership. And, and Catholic churches are Presbyterian in, in their polity. That only the leadership, you know, whether you're a priest or a bishop or a cardinal or a pope, uh, they, they have access to God. So, common person can't understand that's why they don't even really do much with the scripture. And I had a student one time I, and I brought in my Catholic Bible that I had and they said, what is that? And I said, it was a Catholic Bible. She said, I was a Catholic for 40 years. I didn't know we had her own Bible. <laughs> and I said, why? Because they don't take it with them. And you know, it wasn't until 62 that Catholic churches started preaching in English. Before that it was Latin. How many Latin speakers y'all know? <laughs> and the guy with the Vita, no, I saw that. <laughs> 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 I thought the only, you know. 
Well, of course, my answer to that was first Timothy 2.5. There's one mediator. Yeah, between God and you, the man Christ Jesus. Yeah. And then the other one is like what we just said. You know, you go boldly to the throne of God yeah. before a throne. So you don't need the priest or a pastor or anything. Yeah. You just go and Christ is the mediator between us and God. Well, then they even teach it when you pray. You don't go to God. You pray to Mary or to whichever person you need. You know, if you're trying to sell your house, you take a, a statue of Joseph oh, and bury it in your yard. Because Joseph was a carpenter. He knows about houses. He can sell you a house for you. Well, the power of God, can we request the power of God? Absolutely. Now to him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Have you ever felt like you're in your prayers that you're asking God for too much? that you really shouldn't be asking for as much as you do. There are times I've, I've done that. I felt like, you know, there's a lot of people who hold up more problems in this world than what I've got. Uh -huh. And I really don't deserve it. More. Not, I'm asking for way, way too much. No. I, I, you're, we're not above all that we even ask or think. What you're asking, God says, I can handle more than that. I mean, you know, because what I think in my mind I'm thinking is that if God gives all this to me, then nobody else will do that. You won't have enough to give somebody else. Does that make sense? Well, well yeah, how stupid am I? Because God can do above anything and everything we ask for even think. Not, I'm not just simply saying it, but even what we think, God can do much, much more. We can display the glory of God. We are witnesses. Acts 1 8 says, and ye what? What does Acts 1 8 say? Ye shall be what? Witnesses. Did it say you might be witnesses? No, it says you shall be. As children of God, we are witnesses in this world. What are you testifying for? Salvation or sin? You know, everybody in this world is a teacher. What are you teaching? You know, as a believer, what are you teaching lost people? Uh, as a believer, what are you teaching other saved people? Your life will show it. You know, uh, I mean, I was talking about somebody not too long ago, and uh, they came to our church for a while. And in that Come find out this guy had stalked several uh, women and uh, actually cheated with a, a, a woman in our church. And, uh, her husband called and beat the devil out of him. And I thought that was very interesting. It didn't bother me a bit when that happened. <laughs> you know, but he was a great teacher. This guy can teach. He had the ability to communicate in, in such a way that, I mean, it was really impressive. This is the one that got beat up. Yeah. Oh. yeah he, but he had that ability. Yeah. Did I learn anything from him? No. Why? Because I wouldn't listen to anything he said. Because I knew. One. Yeah. I knew what was going on. Everybody else knew what was going on. And he still tried to lie about it to everybody. Well, you did learn something. That he was a chief. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, but as far as you know, making an impact on me, no. Because his life didn't measure up with what he was saying. Mm -hmm. And when a life doesn't measure up, I don't care who it is. It's like singers. I'm not big on gospel singing. I'm not saying that gospel singing is wrong. But, you know, the less I know about singers, the happier I am. Because a lot of times you hear about somebody, and you think, oh, that, man, I love their singing, I love their voice, and you kind of find out what kind of lifestyle they find. Like, turn. like Amy Grant. I don't know if you know who Amy Grant is. Uh, she's still around. Uh, but uh, years ago, she sang a song, Y'all Should I? My first essay, it was a popular song. But anyway, uh, she got out of church and said that she became disillusioned with Jesus Christ. She didn't say I got disillusioned with the church because I'd say amen if she did yeah, because I had to, I've gotten, you know, disillusioned with some church people the way they are. Uh, end up, uh, her and her husband split up because she was running around with some country singer, which she's now married to. I can't think who he is now. Ben Skill. Ben Skill. 
Yeah, and so he left his wife for her, and she left her husband for him. And she tried to sing secular music, and it, uh, nobody listened to her. So she went back singing so-called gospel music, and people just listened to her all the time and think, I can't do that. I mean, she may have a great voice, but I can't do that because of the lifestyle. And, and her, it, I, I'm not impressed by that. Your testimony matters, is what I'm saying. If we don't have a proper testimony, how are we going to be witnesses to the world? Where How can we display the glory of God if our life doesn't measure up with what we're saying? That's why Matthew 7, Judge not lest you be judged, is there to warn us that I tell Levi how to live his life, but I'm not living like that. Then I'm a hypocrite. And nobody's going to listen to me. That's why we have to strive to do the right thing. Thank you.